everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. In celebration of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, Jean Kwok discusses her journey as a writer and her book, Girl in Translation. Jean Kwok is a New York Times and international bestselling author of Girl in Translation, Mambo in Chinatown, and Searching for Sylvie Lee, which is a Read with Jenna Today show book club pick and an instant New York Times bestseller. She immigrated from Hong Kong to Brooklyn when she was five, and worked in a Chinatown clothing factory for most of her childhood. Her work has been published in 20 countries and is taught in schools across the world. Jean has been selected for numerous honors, including the American Library Association Alex Award, the Chinese, Librarian, the Chinese American Librarians Association Best Book Award, and the Sunday Times Short Story Award International Shortlist. Additionally, she received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University and earned an MFA from Columbia University. And today we will be raffling Jean's books out to anyone who asks questions or, or comments in our live stream chat box on the right hand side. So feel free to chime in and we'll put your name on the list. And without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Jean. Hi, Michelle, I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Jean. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of your books, and I'm really excited to kind of share your personal story and, you know, a little bit more of a deeper insight into how you came to write these novels with our audience. Sounds great. And I wanted to start off because some of our readers may not know this, but you're currently living in the Netherlands right now. Is that right? I am. And I was just, um, you know, telling you before the show started that it may look fairly bright where I am, but it's pure artificial light mostly um, because it's, you know, it's 9 p.m. here. So I have a light set up so that it can be fairly bright when I do these Zoom events with the U.S. because it's always with the time for its difference, the evening for me while it's daytime for you guys and especially on the Pacific Coast. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us so late at your time. Um, I'd love to know what has this past year been like for you, you know, in the Netherlands and, you know, experiencing all that the world has been through. You know, it's really interesting. In fact, when it all kind of came down, you know, you know there was, you might remember there was this time when it seemed like, um, Nobody was really sure how serious this thing was. Mm -hmm. Like, was it being over-exaggerated? What was going on? And I was in the U.S. at that time. And mm -hmm. I was um, in New York. And in fact, I was going to a Today Show party with Jenna Bush Hager mm -hmm. and other authors and all of this. And I had to run to the airport after the party. So I brought these, like, suitcases to this very elegant party. <laughs> and, you know, there I am with my rolling suitcases. And um, I ran to the airport. I barely made it for my flight. Uh, and I was flying to Florida, where I was the keynote speaker for a literacy organization there. And in between the time my plane took off in New York and the time it landed in Florida, uh, then President Trump announced that all flights to Europe were being canceled. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, my God. Because, of course, I live in the Netherlands now, even mm -hmm. though I am American and grew up in New York. So... Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh my goodness, I, am mm -hmm. I going to get home in time? Are there going to be any flights? And then, you know, I did manage, I think I came back on one of the very last flights. I think I was on a flight at 9 and 9 p.m. And the last flight was at midnight or something. Um, yeah. And I made it, I made it back to Europe. Um, and, you know, it's been, it's really funny to be an American and watch this from here, because there was a time when it seemed like the European response was, you know, more muscular than the American one. But now the vaccination process in the U.S. is mm. so truly impressive. I mean, I think it's wonderful. Um, but we are behind. You know, we're behind. We are still in lockdown here. Uh, I have not been vaccinated. Nobody I know has really been vaccinated, except uh, only people who are um let's say, you know, of the older generation, but nobody, yeah. none of my friends have been vaccinated, nothing like that. We are slowly coming out of lockdown. So it's almost like, you know, a, a time shift. You're looking at those stars right. in the distance where you realize <laughs> the light has taken so long to reach you that you're looking into the past. You know, I feel that way looking in the U.S. is a kind of alternate future for us at this, uh, at this moment. And I, I think that's very helpful context to provide because, you know, you're right, the pace of vaccinations has been extremely fast here. And so life resuming to some semblance of normalcy, 
you know, is a little bit more close here than I feel like everywhere else. And so people may not realize that internationally, um, the vaccine response just hasn't been as quick or as widely, you know, available. Um, so thank you for sharing those thoughts. You know, I, I think it's a good, you know, reminder for a lot of us who may be listening today. And I would love to know before we start, you know, our conversation, what was your favorite book to read during the pandemic? Oh my gosh, that's a hard one. You know, I read so many books. The only thing about the books that I read is that because I'm an author, I often read ahead. Um, and what that means is that other authors send me their books like a half year to a year before publication. And they say, you know, if you like the book or editors or agents, and they say, if you like the book, will you please, um, you know, say something nice about this book mm -hmm. uh, for, for our publicity, for everything like that. So I've read, um, you know, a lot of fantastic books in that time, uh, including some that have just come out, like The Plot by Jean Hanf Korolitz is a fantastic mm. book that I loved so much. And Laura Dave has a new book that I think just hit number one uh, on the bestseller list. And that's called, uh, I think, What He Never Told You. And then, you know, another book I loved that I read um, was by Gish Jen. She wrote The Resisters. Uh, that was a book that came out a few months ago. Another fantastic novel. So I think it's amazing how many great things are going on today. Well, I'll definitely have to put those on my to read list. It's like ever growing. <laughs> so thank you for those tips. And, and so the first novel that I read of yours, and that's how I discovered you, was Girl in Translation, right? And it's a striking story about a young girl, Kimberly Chang, who immigrates to New York from Hong Kong. You know, she has, you know, intellectual prowess, and, but she lives a double life. She attends a prestigious private school by day, and by night, she's kind of working at a sweatshop and, and her and her mother live in a cockroach infested apartment with, you know, no heat. When I read your author biography, I saw so many parallels between your life and Kimberly Chang's. Can you share with me the story of how you and your family came to America and what that life was like in your early formative years? Right. My debut novel, Girl in Translation, was definitely a semi-autobiographical novel. And um, when I wrote the book, you know, I wrote it as fiction because I felt really ashamed of my past. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, if I... Um, I just, you know, I had lived my whole life feeling like there was nobody like me, you know, that how I lived was so different from how everyone else lived. And so I wrote that as fiction, um, thinking that nobody, it was never going to occur to anyone to say, so was this based on your own life? <laughs> so of course, the book became this international bestseller. And everybody was asking, was this based on your own life? And I realized that's a really important question because what people are really asking is, can people live like this in the United States of America? And the truth is, yes, yes, they can because I did. And since my book has been published, I've met so many people. You know, I've had mm -hmm. readings, and no matter how exclusive the venue at which I give a talk, almost always someone comes up to after, after me and whispers in my ear, you know, this was my life too, or this was my mother's, and please don't tell mm -hmm. anyone, but we also live like this. So I moved from Hong Kong to Brooklyn, New York, when I was five years old. And, you know, I expected skyscrapers and women in fur coats and streets paved with gold. Mm -hmm. And I was only five years old. Kimberly in the novel is actually 11. So she's mm -hmm. older than I was. Um, and we found ourselves in this incredibly rundown, roach infested apartment where the walls were literally coming down around us. Mm -hmm. You know, plaster would fall from the ceiling. Um, if you read Girl in Translation, the apartment that Kimberly in her and her mother live in is exactly the apartment that I grew up in, basically. And the worst thing about that um, apartment was that it was unheated. There was a heating system, but it did not work. So um, New York City in the winter is bitterly, bitterly cold. And to make things worse, the windows in the back of the apartment had been shattered by people who thought it was fun to throw rocks <laughs> through glass and they'd never been repaired by the landlord. So what we did was we took black 
garbage bags and we, you know, used duct tape to cover them up. Uh, the only source of heat that we had in the apartment was the oven, which we turned on and left on 24 hours a day. I mean, now I can think about things like carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah. But, you know, in those days, it was just a, this attempt to survive. And the oven created this tiny circle of warmth in the kitchen, which was offset by the fact that the kitchen windows did not have any glass in them. Hmm. Oh, and then, uh, sorry, and then the other part of the story is that, of course, my family, just like Kimberly, started working in a clothing factory in Chinatown um, at that time. And even though I was only five, I went along to work as well. Well, what an incredible story of resilience, Jean. You know, I feel like oftentimes we don't talk about class and poverty as often as we should, because you're right there, there is an element of taboo and shame that a lot of people feel, especially when they've had the opportunity to transcend, um, you know, the old reality that they used to live in. And for you now, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that you've, you know, achieved success in your literary career. I'm happy that you today no longer need to open the oven to heat your apartment. You have this great kitchen behind you. I, I am really delighted to see, you know, that you you made that journey. And as I was kind of, you know, doing some research about you and your life, um, I remember reading a press memo, you know, that you wrote for Searching for Sylvie Lee, where you wrote, when we moved from Hong Kong to Brooklyn, New York, my older brother Quan and I lost our parents, not to death, but to immigration. And so we meant more to each other than ever. You know, I think this is a sentiment that many immigrant children feel you know, either your parents will you know, work too much or or there's a barrier culturally that exists. Can, can you talk to me a little bit more about that statement that you wrote? I think it was very powerful. I think that um, that I, I think so insightful that you chose um, that statement, because I think it does go to the heart of the immigrant issue with parents. You know, it becomes so complicated, your relationship with your parents. And look, all relationships with parents are complicated. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that when you're an immigrant, what happens is that first of all, there can often be a kind of child parent inversion where the child becomes responsible for the adult because the child will usually pick up the language more quickly than um, the parents do. And so a child becomes the translator, the child becomes the negotiator, the child becomes, you know, has to take over all these roles that the no adult would normally perform. Um, and that's really a great burden, right? Another burden that, um, can fall upon very young shoulders is that of guilt. You know, you know that your parents gave up their lives, they gave up their culture, their diplomas, their livelihood to often give you, the children, a chance. And that is, of course, something that we carry with us, you know, and to what degree can we be free from that? To what degree do we need to repay that debt? Um, and, but I think the other side of that is that it's not all negative, is that it is a tremendous act of love, you know, of love, mm -hmm. generosity, and faith. Immig that's mm -hmm. what immigration is. It's actually, it's a miracle that people mm -hmm. do it. Um, I mean, when I think about my own mother, you know, my mother was this actually very timid, shy woman, and that she immigrated from China to the U.S. is mind-blowing but I know that in large to a large part you know she did that for us and that is something that is I think beautiful um, and to be cherished uh, but yes I, I think that that's something that I deal with in all of my books I mean it's in my most recent book Searching for Sylvie Lee it really is about you know what happens with the American dream and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of talk of does it exist? I do think it does exist, but I think that there's a price mm -hmm. and who pays that price? What is the price and who pays that price? And oftentimes it is the parent and the child, because like you said, Michelle, you know, there becomes this, there can be a gulf within one generation where sometimes the child doesn't even speak the same language as the parent anymore because yeah. they pick up, you know, English. Of course, the, the language that they're being instructed in and are, you know, socializing in and are learning about culture from. I really appreciate, you know, you elaborating on that a little bit more. I thought it was a very touching 
you know, excerpt that, that I read. And I want to ask this question because, you know, Brooklyn is not that far from the Google office in Manhattan. Curious to know, like, if you could go back, what could have helped you? What, what are one or two things that would have made your life better during that time? You know, if anyone wanted to, like, you know, do something for a kid today, what do you think would have been most helpful for you? Well, I think that things have changed a lot since mm -hmm. I was a kid and for the better. You know, when I, I was really thrown into school and there was no ESL class, mm -hmm. there was no interpreter for my parents. There was no kind of, you know, trying to mitigate that divide um, between, you know, people who don't speak the language or, or understand the culture and, you know, the ongoing society. Um, so, you know, a lot of those kind of things have changed. I'll tell you that actually, I think what meant the most to me was that, was that sometimes, um, you know, it, it was a time in my life when I did not tell anyone the truth of my existence. And that's why I said earlier, it was such a shock to me in a way to need to come clean after writing this book and to say, yes, it was actually based on my own real life circumstances. And I had spent my entire life not talking about my past because like you said, I think that people who come from backgrounds like mine mm -hmm. want to leave them behind. You know, so mm -hmm. if either we succeed in leaving them behind and we want to leave them in the past, or we don't succeed. I mean, the vast majority of us don't succeed and are still working, you know, 24 seven just to make ends meet. And those people are also not writing books or giving interviews or talking about yes. their mm -hmm. circumstances. So yeah, I, I just, I, I do think that um, it, it, it's, it's just a difficult issue, you know, how much you keep your past with you and how much you, um, you know, hang on to it. I have a little question for you later in this interview about that. Um, but I think one special thing about your books is you, you give voice to a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise usually have voices in books, right? So someone, you know, Kimberly working in a Chinatown garment factory, you know, as, as a young girl, right, um, after school. Um, even in Mambo in Chinatown, your second book, um, it's, he was doing a waiter job, right? So these are all jobs that um, sometimes we just don't talk about uh, what those lived realities look like um, and how people make ends meet. So I, I appreciate that, you know, you, you've taken on the, the role of writing those voices out. And I, I want to transition to something that I thought was a huge exemplary you know, example of, of your resilience. And that is you became a writer. And I don't think that this could have been the easiest choice that you could have made um, considering your experience with poverty, right? And what I mean by that is I, I've always thought at least that the arts and literature, et cetera, always seem to be most accessible to those who had a more comfortable cushion or, or safety blanket um, of wealth, you know, underneath them, you know, to be able to make that choice. And so you matriculated at Harvard, um, you know, you thought you would study the sciences, but you soon realized that you could pursue your dream, right? And, and you switch your majors to English and American literature. You know, what was the catalyst for that decision? It must have been, you know, a lot of soul searching, I imagine. Michelle, I think that is such a great question. And it was so, it's so true because it did not occur to me to be a writer. I didn't even know people could be writers. I mean, I like, I, all I was trying to do was trying to get out of the factory. I mean, that was kind of my whole goal in life, not to be kept in that circle of life in the factory where you enter as a child and you leave as an old woman um, just mm. before your deathbed. So, you know, that was pretty Pretty much my only goal and um it did not I, I loved books I loved reading you know they were my escape and I always loved them and I kept a journal from a very young age but I it never occurred to me to write creatively um because I I I just really didn't know what that was you know I have writer friends who their parents were writers you know they knew they wanted to be a writer and sometimes I really envy that you know they have a kind of self-assurance a kind of relaxed relationship with their um, decision to be in the arts and to be a writer with that I really don't have. That's something that I've had to fight for um, to claim this identity of being in the arts and being a writer. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, I, I, 
so basically when I was really young uh, and I was working at the factory, I come from a very old fashioned family and um, in a Chinese family, there's this hierarchy. The hierarchy is based on age and gender. And I'm the youngest of seven children and I'm obviously female. So I was the lowest of the low. Like You could not get lower than me. Um, so in my family, it was, I mean, they loved me a lot, you know, and they thought education was important and all of those things, but nobody expected that much of me. You know, there's so much talk nowadays about tiger moms. Like I, oh my God. I mean, I would have killed to have a, a piano <laughs> lesson. Like, no, like I did not have access to dance lessons, piano, nothing, nothing like that. And so, um, I understood from a really young age that basically I had two choices in my life. And one choice was to work at the factory until I died. Or the other choice was to maybe find some nice young man who might work at the factory or maybe an accountant's office or something. And I could marry him and then I could take care of his children and cook and clean for him. And, you know, I was, of course, from the beginning, like the most atrocious cook and housekeeper ever, which I am to this day. And so um, I had I looked at these two paths and I thought, you know what? I know what I'm going to pick. I thought I'm going to go to Harvard. And I decided that when I was in elementary school, I think I was in about second or third grade. And that I aimed my life towards that. I knew that was my only chance because Harvard was the only school that my parents had ever heard of. And so if I didn't get to Harvard, no matter how excellent the school, they'll be like, we never heard of that school. That is a scary thing. You are not going. Um, so that was um, where I aimed, but I planned to go and be a scientist and be a real person with a real job. Um, but that, as you can tell, did not happen for me. And it was really at Harvard that I was up late one night and I was working on a, a problem set for physics class. And I was pulling an all-nighter because, of course, I'd left it to the last moment. And I was like trying to figure this thing out. I'm mm -hmm. jotting notes on a pad. And then I suddenly wrote a poem and I was like, I just stared at that thing on the page. I was like, I really felt like I'd laid an egg. You know, I was so <laughs> astonished. It had, I had never imagined that I would do a thing like that. And then I think from that moment on, I realized I wanted to become a writer. You know, what a phenomenal story. I feel like, you know, I've interviewed quite a few authors at Toxic Google and, and primarily a lot of Asian American authors. And I think the, Arc always goes, I didn't even know that I could have chosen to be a writer. I never grew up with any writers. I, didn't, I had never met a writer until you know, I went to college or started my MFA program. So I think where you start is you know, a place where many people, you know, children of immigrants, they also began, which is you don't know what's available until you go out there and see. And I have to say, you were quite tenacious. You know, early on, you knew where you wanted to go. You directed yourself there and you got there, which I think is incredible. Um, I also want to ask really quickly, too, you know, I think many people from first generation immigrant backgrounds often feel like they need to sideline passions for stability, right? Did you feel any sense of guilt or pressure to choose a different type of career? And if so, like, how did you overcome it? I absolutely did. I mean, I, I think this is something that I get asked a lot at when I give talks, you know, how do you balance um, the guilt, you know, the guilt with your own desires. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I'm a, a little bit in a strange position because I am myself a first generation immigrant, you know, so I came here really young. So I do understand and sympathize with the parents perspective. I and of course, I'm two times an immigrant, you know, I moved yeah. from Hong Kong to the US. And then I moved again as an adult from um, the US to the Netherlands, which is where I'm talking to you from now. You know, basically, I moved here for love, for love, and my mm -hmm. family is here. So I'm, I bring up my kids in the Netherlands and so forth. So I've seen it from both, um, from both sides. I think that, you know, I, I think that of course we have an obligation to love our parents and to respect them and to care for them. But the bottom line is, I believe your life is your own, and I don't think 
anyone has the right to tell you what to do with your life. So that said, you know, don't go crazy. Like don't go, you know, be a trapeze artist when you have no talent and are afraid of heights, right? Like, you know, I mm -hmm. did make sure I had a degree. Um, I worked, you know, I worked many jobs. I worked four jobs at a time to put myself through Harvard and I worked ever since. I mean, I was always working job after job on top of job to keep myself afloat until Girl in Translation was successful enough that I could quit and become a full-time writer. Um, so my life is relatively extremely peaceful uh, these days. But I, I do think you have to have a backup plan. You, you can never know for sure. But I believe your life was given to you and you have the right to live it. Absolutely. I think that's great advice to any aspiring writer who may feel, you know, a tinge you know, of doubt um, about whether they're making the right decision. Um, also, you had the work ethic, you know, you had the dream, but you also had the work ethic to make sure that you executed it. So I think part of making sure that you get to where you go is also executing and making sure you do and, and you're trying, right? Um, so I sense a lot of parts of your personal life you know, weaved into your books. And your most recent novel in, in 2019 was Searching for Sylvie Lee. And it was born from your love and loss, you know, of your older brother to a tragic pl plane crash in 20, uh, 2009. And I found an excerpt that you wrote about him that I want to read to our listeners. Um, One night I woke up upon a, the mattress on the floor where I slept. Juan had returned from his restaurant job and laid a small wrapped brown package next to me. It was a present. We were paid one cent per garment at the factory, so I did not receive many gifts. To this day, I am amazed that he did not give me a toy or a piece of candy, but something that would change my life. It was a blank diary, and he said, whatever you write in this will belong to you. You know, and I, I'm so glad that your, your brother, your older brother, gifted you the diary because, you know, the world can now enjoy your novels and your thoughts. But I want to know how you confront and work through these moments of emotion, like losing your brother, right, in your lived experiences and what the process of that is like incorporating all these, you know, experiences into your novels. Is it painful, cathartic? How do you feel? You know, I think that it's a contradictory process, which many writers will experience if they try to write about something that's deeply personal to them. I think that, you know, it is, of course, cathartic because when you shine a light upon something, no matter how ugly or dismal that thing might be or how torturous, the illumination of it transforms it. And that illumination, that clarity makes it into something beautiful because beautiful beauty is, of course, not a predetermined set of characteristics. It is mm -hmm. actually, I think, paying attention to what something truly is. And um, so I do think that a lot of writers, when they try to write something deeply personal, you want to do it, but you can also really get stuck. And um, like you said, Searching for Sylvie Lee is absolutely inspired by uh, the disappearance of my brother, Quan, my beloved brother who gave me that diary when we were still living in that you know frozen apartment and I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor at night while like the mice ran past me. So um, it was a really, really difficult experience for me. And I found that when I tried to write about it, I, I really, I just couldn't. When the sibling was a guy. And so in searching for Sylvie Lee, I changed the sister who disappears. I mean, the person who disappears to a woman. And so searching for Sylvie Lee is about um, these two sisters, the beautiful, dazzling uh, older sister, Sylvie, who disappears while on a trip to the Netherlands, and her younger, stuttering, shy sister, Amy, who's got to pull herself together and try to figure out what's happened to her older sister. And so what, um, you know, this obviously has parallels in my own life. And the moment I changed the gender of the heroine, I was able to write the novel. Um, and I do think that it was a really rewarding and cathartic experience to be able to write this story that's connected so to something that means so much to me, but that you know takes on its own fictional life. 
Absolutely. And it's interesting. If anyone's having any writer's block, maybe you just need to switch some genders out and it might be easier to be in that state of mind to write from that perspective. That's an interesting tip, actually. And I think you're right. It is hard always to write about things that are personal to you, right? Because it feels so much closer and so much more intimate and it may feel like you're bearing much more of yourself in a very vulnerable state than you may want to share <laughs> with the average uh, reader. So thank you for, for your thoughts about that. And I want to talk a little bit more about the Netherlands, right? Um, and just about Asian identity in Europe, since you have straddled, you know, two different continents, Americas and Europe, um, Asian Americans, I think, have been having quite the political and activist awakening in the past year, um, as the community has come under attack with increased hate crimes. Um, America has always been a big export of culture, right? And progressive discussions about race are now trickling into a lot of European campuses. You know, how do you currently think the Asian identity and diversity in general is being shaped and discussed in Europe today? I think that um, the rising awareness of Asian, anti-Asian sentiment has been good in a way, in the sense that it has triggered much more discussion than has previously existed. I do believe that in Europe in general and in the Netherlands in particular, um, the discussion of race is lags behind that of, you know, that in the United States. I think that there are just so many fewer of us here and there are fewer people who are writing, there are fewer people who are protesting. You know, there's just, um, it's just harder to coalesce. But I do believe that uh, steps are being taken. And for example, I was recently invited to be a, um, a regular guest on a national uh, radio program to discuss their news because they wanted a more diverse point of view. You know, they wanted to look at things in a way that it might be different from the way the typical Dutch person might do that. Um, and I think things like that are a really important first step here, but I, I think we do still have quite a ways to go. All right, I, I'm kind of excited to see where Europe kind of goes with this in the next decade or so, just because, you know, the demographics are diversifying quite a bit. Um, immigration trends are, you know, changing um, parts of the countries there. So, I'd also love to know, you know, having straddled the world as an immigrant multiple times over, um, as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, Jean, you know, you've lived on both continents. What are your likes and dislikes about each respective society? I think that, um, well, the thing is, when you have moved around as much as I have, you know, you're kind of the perpetual foreigner. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's good and it's bad. I mean, of course, you know, the negative part of that is that you never think quite the same way as the default. You know, the default is everyone has a default and you are trying to figure out what that is and what their default is may be very different from what you think. And so, you know, wherever I am, I always feel a little bit out of step, but I've come to realize that that's actually a great gift because it means I have to think independently. You know, when you know there, when you have to choose, you know, there is a choice instead of being, you know, kind of just going with the flow and not realizing that you are making decisions um, without knowing it. So I think that, you know, the United States, for example, I think it's a society that is extremely uh, individualistic and has a tremendous amount of respect for art, individuality, individual expression. Um, and the Netherlands is a far more cohesive society. So it is a place where, um, you know, for example, if you go to a birthday party here in the mm. Netherlands, it's the craziest thing, okay? <laughs> you go to a birthday party, any birthday party, any age, what they will all do is no matter how you've set up the chairs, and if you're not me, you know, if you're Dutch, you will have yeah. already set up the chairs this way. They will move the chairs into one big circle one big circle mm -hmm. so that 
everyone is included. They are not small groups, you know, that have broken up to have an intimate mm-hmm. conversation. You're, you know, if you think there's a cute guy at the party, you yeah. may see him three st- three chairs away from you, but like his grandmother is looking at you too. Like, I was like, how did they ever reproduce here? Like, there's something about this mating dance that I do not understand. Um, but yeah, those are the kind of things that you deal with when you change societies. Absolutely. What a great insight. I mean, for any people who might be in the Netherlands interested in getting some dating tips, it seems like Jean (laughs) has some experience that you could uh, learn from uh, if you write to her. And I want to talk about uh, transition a little bit to, you know, this this fluid identity that that you have, right? Having lived in so many different places. Um, When people think about Asian Americans, you know, we hear stats that Asian Americans are among some of the highest earners in the United States. And when we think about Asia, people often think about the crazy rich Asians narrative, right? There's economic boom, um, there's a lot of financial success, et cetera. And in your books and in your life, you have also crossed many different borders of class. You know, your teenage years were spent working at a sweatshop in Chinatown, and then you entered the hollow halls of Harvard at 18, right? The same goes for your protagonist in the, the novel Girl in Translation where um, her love interest, you know, Matt wanted her to forego Yale and build a life of him. So what do you think, you know, what advice do you have about moving between class boundaries, right? Like, were you shocked when you arrived at Harvard and, and realized, like, maybe not everyone lived the same way that I did? Like, how, how did you manage, you know, all those, um, you know, dissonance that, that you may have experienced? You know, I think the thing that I have learned that is most valuable from you know, moving through class, you know, through culture, through countries, through languages, um, is that I think that you have to understand that your identity lies within yourself. And you have to keep that close. You know, what I mean by that is that when you become an expat, and you move from one country to another, or an immigrant, right, and you go, what you realize when you are in the new situation is how much of your identity had been reflected back on you by other people. And what I mean by that is that then, you know, you can go up to somebody and you say, well, I, you know, I grew up in this village in North Carolina. And they're like, oh, I know. And, you know, they understand that that was an affluent um, area and that that says something about you or that you have a diploma from this place. And they understand that that means something about you. And when you move out of your normal environment, what you understand is that those reflections go away. You know, when you tell people, yes, well, I'm, you know, you're trying to humble brag. It's like, it's not working because nobody gets it that you are impressive. You know, you're just being humble. So, you know, that when that happens, what you have to understand is that the true value of your identity is within yourself. And of course, you connect, you make friends, you try to assimilate, but the core of who you are doesn't change. I am not a better or worse person now that I am no longer poor. You know, I am not a better or worse person because I am no longer the lowliest assistant in the room, which why I was for many years. You know, I, that has not changed. And I, I like to think that the way I am has also not changed because I really don't believe that that sort of thing gives anybody any right to feel superior to any other person. I think that our only value is actually in how kind we are, how good we are, how, you know, how we interact with the world and not to do with things like money or class or race or um, things like that. Well, it's interesting that you mention all of this. Um, I think primarily because, you know, sometimes we do assign like, you know, beauty and superiority and morality, et cetera, to those who, you know, may have more at times, right? And I think it's very unique that you've brought up, hey, you know, regardless of where you are and where you land in life, you still kind of remain who you are today, right? And I think it's a difficult transition that many students and many young people have to make when they transcend poverty, is they may not have holidayed in Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, or they may not know, you know, 
what the status signaling virtues are um, in the societies that they may join, right? So I, I appreciate you sharing that for anyone who may listen. Um, and I've got just a few more questions for you before we move into Q&A. And, and the first one is, you know, thus far, you've primarily written about Asian communities. And if you had to write any book of choice, is there a specific preference you might have? A historical epic, you know, a drama, um, yeah. any type of novel? What, what's your dream? Well, I, I think that, you know, the, the book that I most dream of writing is the book I'm writing right now. <laughs> so the, mm -hmm. my new book that I'm, I'm working on. And um, it's interesting you said I've primarily written about Asian Americans. And I think that's really true. Uh, but in my new book, actually, there's a collision between an Asian American, a young Asian American woman and a wealthy American family. And that is really fascinating um, to me. And it's really a lot of fun to be able to delve into both worlds, you know, in the working class world and this very elite, wealthy world full of status signifiers. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Um, do you have an idea as, as to when it may be published for all your fans or when they can anticipate a pre-order? Well, I, we don't have a date yet, but I am close to finishing the manuscript and I'm really, um, I'm really excited about it. Can I, can I tell you a little bit about it? Do we absolutely. Have, do okay. to hear about it. Of course, we definitely have the time. So please let me know. Well, okay, so it's right now it's called The Leftover Woman. And it's about this young Chinese woman named um, Jasmine Yang who comes to the US and she wants to start afresh, but she's got these secrets from her past that are threatening to unravel her new life. And then she's really desperate for funds. So she winds up taking a job as a cocktail waitress in an mm. Asian strip club. So it's very timely. Like it very much has to do with a lot of things that are going on today by accident. But Jasmine's life then collides in this surprising way with that of a wealthy American family. And in the family, we have a, the wife is a publishing executive who's embroiled in a scandal. The husband is a Columbia professor of languages, of Chinese languages, uh, who's suspected of having an affair. And they mm. have an adopted Chinese daughter and a very mysterious au pair. And this collision of these two worlds ends in murder. So it's a book about appearances and how hard it is to see someone truly, like especially across race, culture, and class. Well, gee, this sounds like a very juicy book and it has all the elements of, you know, something that would keep you captivated. There's drama, there's murder, there's mystery, um, there's, you know, scandal. So I'm very interested to see when it comes out. I'm, I'm sure I will devour it um, just as I did, you know, Girl with Girl in Translation, your, your debut novel. Um, so, I mean, do you ever anticipate that you'd want some of these novels to become films to become series. I mean, this last one that you just spoke about definitely seems right for like HBO drama or something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah, actually, um, I am not a liberty to disclose details, but mm -hmm. um, my books have been optioned. So there are there are potential series or films in the works. So that is exciting. Um, th those are the books that are you know, already on the market. Yeah. This upcoming one, you know, we will have to see. Um, but that is, uh, no, that's of course very thrilling. And to be able to get to talk to people who are interested in making it into a film um, or a streaming series, for example, is, is I, find that I find it really a privilege to hear how somebody else would transpose your work into another art form. Absolutely. And I, I'm really looking forward to hearing about Jasmine's story when this book comes out. I, I can see this sort of scenario playing out, you know, somewhere in the world and maybe. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, and since we are almost at close, I have one last question for you. And it would be for aspiring writers or creatives today. What is the single most important piece of advice that you would give to them, you know, as they pursue their creative pursuits? I think that um, I've seen a lot of people want to become writers. And I think that the people who are left standing 
don't have as much to do with talent as you would think. I mean, I think, of course, talent is important. But most of the time, people aren't interested in writing unless they have some degree of talent for it. I think that what makes people fall off the truck is that um, it's their capacity to accept rejection and, mm -hmm. and to be able to deal with failure. And I think that, you know, if you're going to be a writer, God, they live to reject you. You know, they, <laughs> it makes their day. They're like, just come here, baby. Let me just reject you right now. <laughs> so, you know, so I think, you know, you have to know that and you have to be able to deal with that. And you have to know that it's not a mark or judgment or that they're right. You know, you have to keep believing in yourself and understand, obviously learn and grow and accept good advice. But on the other hand, you know, just because person A says your book is never going to make it does not mean that it's never going to make it. And I think it's not just for writing, but in general, I think the difference between people who are, become really successful and the ones who stop and don't is that the ones who are really become successful get up again. You know, it's just mm -hmm. about getting up again, getting knocked down and getting up again and, you know, being like Teflon and letting it roll off you and trying again. You know, Gina, I think that's advice that will always stand the test of time. Um, our theme for the Asian Pacific uh, American Heritage Month is actually resilience. And like I said multiple times today, I think you embody that. And I think the advice that you gave also embodies that. And, and you're right, you know, regardless of what you do in life, may it be business, may it be literature, may it be art, there will always be someone who has an opinion about what you're producing, whether it's it's good, whether it's, you know, marketable, et cetera. But so long as I think you have confidence in your vision and just brush it off, you know, when you have something that, um, you know, is a little bit negative or um, is a little bit of a downer and keep on moving on. I think that's how you get to it, because every person who I've spoken to who is an author has said, well, I got rejected multiple times before my New York Times bestselling author, you know, book kind of came out. Multiple people, um, you know, rejected my manuscript. And I would say one of the most commercially successful authors, J.K. Rowling, for example, I think she had to ship that out at least you know, over a dozen times before a publisher would finally take her. And it became one of the most popular, you know, series of modern day times. So thank you, Jean, so much for sharing so much of your your life experiences today with us and for being so open about, you know, the, the inspirations that have made you the brilliant author that you are. Um, I know we have a few questions um, in the chat. So I'm going to transition over to those now for our Q&A section. And the first one is from Farah. And she said, thanks for coming in today, Jean. Based on your experience in writing your books and becoming a best-selling author, is there anything you would have done differently? Well, I, I think that's a great question. And um, in terms of is there, you know, do I have any regrets about my path? No, I, you know, I wouldn't change anything if I could go back. But however, I have to tell you that I was like the least, clueful writer there was like I did everything wrong as an expiring writer I think that um, for example you know I was at Columbia and this big deal editor came to speak and you know everyone was kind of fawning over her and at the end of her talk there was this rush of people to like who surrounded her to tell her about you know how charming and witty they were and <laughs> the stories and all this and I was the kid I mean, you know, I was the student who um, was in the back of the room, did not ask any questions, and then like quietly snuck away without saying anything to anyone at the end of the talk. So, you know, that was not clever. I mean, of course, I should have uh, been good at networking and managed to meet her or something. But I actually did submit my manuscript to her uh, a few months later completely out of the slush pile. I mean, she did not know who I was because I had mm -hmm. obviously not used my connection or my wit or anything in any way. And she published it, you know? So yeah. I would say those of you who may not be so good or so savvy, you know, you probably could not be worse than I was. And, you know, I still made it. So I do believe that in the end, um, the quality of your manuscript, the quality of your writing, that is everything. Yes, no amount of, I think, charm or networking can make up for 
if you just don't have a solid manuscript to publish. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, being a little bit shy to approach the, this famous editor, right? And I think it's something we see often in, you know, first generation students um, and students of color who sometimes don't feel as entitled to being able to ask for help, the first part, right? And I think the second part too is being entitled to actually be a part of that conversation um, up in front in the center with everyone. There may be a shyness or, um, you know, a desire to maybe step back and not be as, um, as loud as everyone else, right? So for those who are in the call and who, who do wanna make their mark there, I would say, don't be shy, you know, go up and ask your questions. If you don't ask, um, you never know what you're gonna get. So I, I'm really glad that even though you were shy that day, Jean, that you, you ended up sending her something, right? You, you weren't so shy that you didn't send her, you know, that you didn't send something to her. No, I think I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, um, you know, part of it is overcoming the shyness. And, you know, I think something else is asking and making connections with community and with help, you know, mm -hmm. so for example, I, I told you about my, my the book that I'm writing now. And, you know, what I didn't mention is that I have this wonderful literary friendship with um, author Angie Kim, who is the uh, author of a phenomenal book called Miracle Creek. And Angie and I are friends and writing partners, you know, so I send her drafts, she sends me drafts, mm -hmm. we ask each other for advice, you know, we talk about everything from film rights to book deals, to should our character, you know, do A, B or C. And I think that there's a lot of support that you can find um, from each other, from your community, from authors that you meet at readings. And uh, I, you know, I, I was very unable to do that because I was just so painfully uh, shy at that point in my life. But I would say, you know, come and meet us. You know, for example, I'm on social media. I'd love if you guys would connect with me and send me a question if you don't get a chance to ask it today. Thank you, Jean, for your warm welcome to anyone to contact you. I, I do think that's true. People, um, you know, people underestimate sometimes the network of you know, the, the power of a, s a support network, right? And accountability partners um, as you're trying to build anything. It's always important to have those things. So I want to move to our next question. And our next question is from Trang Pham. And it is, who are your favorite writers and why? Thanks. Right. So that's, uh, you know, actually really ties into what I was just talking about. You know, the reason I became friends with Angie Kim was because her book, Miracle Creek, was one of my favorite books. And um, we were introduced years ago by a mutual friend called M Marie Myung Ok. Uh, Lee. And, you know, it was, we had met very briefly, but I didn't really know her. And she was writing her book then. It wasn't out yet. And then years later, I um, heard everyone talking about this great book, Miracle Creek. What was it? Mm -hmm. And I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, I love this book. It's a story about this tragedy that unfolds when an experimental medical facility owned by a Korean family catches on fire mm -hmm. and like two people are killed and people are injured as this kind of gripping page turner and also very literary exploration of immigration and race and special needs kids and so on. And so that was how our friendship developed from our admiration from each other. Another book that I really, um, I really do love is uh, Gish Jen's The Resistors, which came out uh, a couple of months ago. And it's a really poignant novel. It's a kind of dystopian future, you know, based upon the dangers mm -hmm. of our present world. Um, I have to say that, you know, one of my core classic writers that I love very much is Margaret Atwood. Oh, um, yes. She's Canadian, I believe. Yes, she, <laughs> yes, she is. And I I just, I'm, I love her work so much. And and, you know, I know everyone's all about Handmaid's Tale and stuff, which mm -hmm. is a fantastic book. But I, um, I love uh, Cat's Eye and The Blind Assassin. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, there are books that you read again and again and again. And, you know, her books are those types of books for me. That's wonderful. I read a lot of Margaret Atwood as well growing up. And I saw you also read a lot of Louisa May Alcott, the classics, et cetera, growing up as well. So um, it's delightful to see that some books just never lose their 
they're you know timeless effect regardless of what generation they're being read by and i want to move to our last question because i know we're coming up to our, our mark and this is from michael mac mcdermott do you think being in lockdown for so long helped or hurt your writing process did it give you more or less time to focus on putting pen to paper you know, Mac, I think um, that is a really interesting question. I think that I had more time, of course, because um, I wasn't traveling as much as I normally do. And so I had more time at home. But in some ways, I'm afraid I was less productive. Like I wish I could say <laughs> I was more productive. But now, you know, now we're in a brighter period where we're coming out of um, that darkness. But there was just so much going on. And in the US, you know, of course, there was the election and all of the chaos around the election and, um, you know, the pandemic and were we going to find a vaccine in time? And it was really stressful. I mean, I think that there are writers who, um, you know, wrote more than they ever had. I, I worked and I managed to move forward with my book, but it was really a struggle. And it's really been much better this year now that we've kind of turned the corner mm -hmm. and you know that we are going to get this under control, which yeah, I knew we would, but it, it's still a very stressful um, and frightening time. So I'm glad we're through it. Uh, and I've, you know, I'm glad to be able to be working solidly now. And I, I think what you just shared, Jean, is, is very true, right? We had a lot of time at home last year, but it wasn't a normal time. And it would be remiss to say that everything was business as usual, even though we were operating very much in that way. Um, I think all around us, there were all sorts of you know crises on, on many different levels, politically, socially, racially, you know, health wise, medically. So um, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, this year we have turned the corner and hopefully your writing has, a, you know, more of a focus and a joy and rejuvenation to it than it did last year. Because I know many of us may have felt down so at, at times because we were all isolated from one another. So I think the last comment we have is um, from Lillian and she says, can't wait for your new ju juicy book, fellow Chinese American immigrant who grew up in New York City and living in Brooklyn. Um, and she wants to send her thanks. And with that, um, Jean, it's been a pleasure having you on Talks at Google today. I cannot wait for your new book as well. So everyone stay tuned for that. And who knows, we may also see series, films in the future. We don't know where all of this could go. Um, and if you want to reach out to Jean, um, Jean, do you want to share your, your Instagram or your social details really quickly before we sign off? Sure. I'm just, uh, you know, my website is jeanquok.com. And from there, you can get to everyone, everything else. On Instagram, I'm jeanquok author. And on Twitter and Facebook, I think I'm just jeanquok. So, but if you look for me, I'll, um, I'll see you there. And Michelle, thank you for this amazing interview. As always, you're a fantastic interviewer. So, and thank you all so much for having me. All right. Thank you so much, Jean, and everyone for joining today as a part of our Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Thank you all.